So this is the second part of how I think you can break into TV and film music. Obviously these are just my opinions, there are always edge cases, I make massive generalizations and a lot of you, certainly maybe people in America may go, that just isn't how it is over here. Uh, so these are based on observations I've made over the last 25 years and the last part uh, was basically a context piece, it was how I got into the industry and I readily admitted that the doors that were open to me have long since closed. I think one of the key reasons that this bit of the series is going to go out of date quickly is we're living in changing times. Not only uh, does technology change the way we work, technology is radically changing the way in which our work is being delivered. So kind of internet book order companies that were you know, delivering by post office vans 10, 15 years ago, and now major, major players in the creation of what is now called content. I'm sorry, it's way too windy up here. I'm gonna find somewhere a little bit more sheltered. I'm not religious, but my favorite saying is, how do you make God laugh? Tell him your plans. And whilst I'm very thankful to have achieved something that I've dreamt of doing since I was five years old. I do think it's peculiar that we grasp onto that. I've been dreaming of doing this since I was five, so I've got to do it. I have a five-year-old and he's in no position to make career plans. I guess being open-minded and just going with the flow a little bit. Um, there's never a point where you go, this is it, this is what I've set out to achieve. It's all about the journey and if you don't enjoy it, there's simply no point to it whatsoever. So when saying, you know, you've got to keep an open mind, I would just say, go where the happiness and the flow of enjoyment takes you. Because just killing yourself working all hours, God sends, working for pricks, doing music that you hate doing, is just totally pointless. Okay, so I'm just gonna pause here because I think um, a composer said very much the same thing to me about 10, 15 years ago. And I thought, oh, well, that's all very well for you to say, but I'm, I'm not at a stage in my career to pick and choose, which he then laughed at, and I will return turn to this in part three, I do kind of think that he was right. So how do you break into film and TV music today? Well, as I mentioned in my last piece, um, there was a guy, a student I spoke to, who wanted to interview me for his thesis, and he says, I understand there's two ways of breaking into film and TV music. First way is to become a composer's assistant, and the second way is to do lots of free films and short films for uh, wannabe directors. And I said, well, you don't do it the second way. And I guess I want to tackle this myth, I'm sure this is, I'm gonna try and make this the last saying that I utter today, but this is a really good one. And strangely, it's by Dick Van Dyke. He was talking about things he's learned throughout his life, because he's getting on a bit now, Dick Van Dyke. He strikes me as a really nice bloke. Terrible Cockney accent, lovely bloke. And what he said was, by the time you're 45, you have to unlearn as much as you've learned, because people tell you stuff that just isn't true. And I think the first is this myth of a director in film school, doing a crappy two minute film, which you whack some amazing music on, him taking you all the way to kind of Nolan Heights. It's not the fault of the directors. I don't feel they should be put under this pressure of making relationships with people and asking the impossible of people for free and then expect to kind of for a lifetime pay them back. I simply don't think it's fair. Daniel Pemberton and I had a discussion about this and I think Daniel made a good point. He said it's like, you know, directors are like, they go to parties with the, these amazing people, famous people, and sometimes they have a plus one and sometimes they don't. And I think that that is a fair observation. I think directors are like racing car drivers. And I think whilst you're working within your category, they will be very loyal to you. But say they go from riding go-karts to the Indy, I don't know the name, the Indy 500. I think it's gonna be very hard for him to take his go-kart team and to bring them all up to the next category. What happens is the director gets drawn into the next category, gets surrounded by experts and and you know off they go and the go-kart guys if they want to become specialist in Indy 500 engines they have to kind of work themselves at that and I think that what happens is when they become Formula One drivers naturally hugely expensive teams with you know huge amounts of sponsorship are they going to be able to take their Indy 500 engineers into Formula One no they're not possibly you know there may be their masseuse so often maybe editors move up with directors, but I just think you just need to bury that myth. So in answer to that guy about doing freebies for directors um, and hoping they're gonna bring you up, I just think, yes, for a show reel, great. Yes, to get experience, fantastic. But I think it is a real hole you can work in. For me, there are two ways into film and TV music. One is to become a legitimate head of department, 
hot. The other way is to become a successful composer. Now these things can intersect. So there are many, many examples of people who have become successful I wouldn't use the word composers, I would use the word musicians or music makers. So the Johnny Greenwoods of this world, I mean, it comes from a long tradition. So to the person who's kind of graduating up through the ranks to become a head of department, it can be quite frustrating to see some rock and roller suddenly appear on the scene and start being nominated for Oscars and BAFTAs and Ivan Novellos. All I have to say to that is Johnny Greenwood had to play Creep a lot of fucking times before he got to the position where he could be trusted with these amazing movies that he's doing. I can't speak of becoming a successful music maker as a way into film and TV. You'd have to talk to maybe Olafur Arnolds about that and how he takes his experience from that world of making records and applies it to his amazing and extraordinary TV music. I can only speak from the point of view of working your way up as a head of department. And that is basically what the two jobs of being a film composer are. And that is that you are, you have to write some music that's appropriate and matches the emotion and enhances the emotion of the piece. Very basically put, it's simply coming up with a few notes that are great notes and in the right order. Now, if you orchestrate them, arrange them, that's great, but it's not actually part of your job. So I think that you have to cast away this, well, you know, it's great, you know, I mean, obviously it was a great theme and it was absolutely perfect for the movie and it really enhanced the emotional uh, sensation. But, you know, he didn't write those ostinatos that were underneath and all of those, like, it, it's not, that's not the job. The job is to create a musical landscape that matches the emotion. That's your composer job. The other job, is head of department. And this is something that I just don't think is really being taught that effectively at the moment. This is putting a team together and making sure it's delivered on time, on budget. I guess what I've just described is actually a music supervisor. So I've just paused for a second because I think there's a better and simpler explanation of an HOD. And that is simply, it's where the buck stops. It's the person whose ass gets kicked. A good HOD is one that uses her or his experience working across a broad range of musical, technical and emotional skill sets and can satisfy the cross-discipline demands of any show in a professional manner. A good HOD uses their wealth of experience to immediately suggest solutions to problems, whether that be dropping frames, dropping samples, to interpreting offensive notes and directions given to the composer by filmmakers. This is what the producers are interested in and the producers are the people who pay you. And successful producers tend to be a lot older. I don't know, you get to a certain age, like at 45, I don't see old people anymore, I just see tired people. And I have these shocking experiences of going to the doctors and going, why is this child putting a needle in my arm? People in their early 20s look like children. So to a producer granting you a $200,000 budget, you know, it's a, it's a, it takes a big leap of faith to hand that to someone who appears to be a child. So the very basic kind of problem with working your way up as a hod is that you have to mature. And in so doing, I think you must expect it to take at least 10 years. And taking that into account, I think it's really important, which I'll get onto in the third part, to nourish yourself so that you are a fully nourished artistic human being. And not do what I did, which was just jump at every possible opportunity so that you could go, hey, look, <laughs> worked a picture. Hey, it's in the Curzon for one night and all of that kind of stuff. I don't know if I'm being clear here. Maybe not. Um, so the ways of working yourself up, you know, through the ranks to become a head of department, the most common way is to become a composer's assistant. If your college hasn't taught you how to use Pro Tools, they have betrayed you. Pro Tools is the only universal music software that we have. So if that's the way you want to go, gotta learn Pro Tools and become a ninja at it. Composers tend to be not very good at Pro Tools, so this is a skill they're really looking for. The common route with composers' assistants is they will eventually start possibly doing some programming for them, and then possibly there'll be a little bit of like diegetic jukebox music. Could you do that? You've got a band. Can you do something for the jukebox? And then what slowly happens is, lo and behold, you maybe start doing cues, and then suddenly it might become a co-write, the composer's taken on a job that he doesn't really have time to do. Listen, if I kind of exec you and maybe write the main themes, can uh, you do it? Um, and then lo and behold, at some point, uh, people feel that you are at the position where you've graduated at a hod, you're a bit fatter, a bit greyer, and you've got some wrinkles and you look like a, a troubled uh, head of department. If you want to be a successful composer's assistant, and I wasn't, I've just turned my camera around because I've realized that I'm in total silhouette. 
Oh, you'll make a cameraman of me yet. So what I was talking about, so being a successful composer's assistant, just got, you've got to be great to be around and be contritious, you know, really apologize when you've made a mistake, admit when you've made a mistake, and for God's sake, back up when they ask you to. But there are many other ways of becoming a successful or graduated HOD. A great example is Ben Valfish, who's a fantastic orchestrator and conductor, an absolute musical genius. And instead of troubling himself with track laying and all of that malarkey, he simply worked for the greatest composers, namely Dario Marianelli. And so he's gone that route. You know, there are examples of Oscar winners who were music editors. I'm, uh, I would say I was a drum programmer. So there are many technical jobs that you can do to be part of the, the, the artisans that work around a composer from which you can learn the process of, you know, 1MO2 and, OK, they synchronise like that and, oh, that's how you run a session. There are many things that you can do that will graduate you through to be a successful head of department. Now, what do I think about the two different approaches, successful music maker versus uh, graduating as an HOD? Well, I think the HOD route uh, will give you a firm grounding in the craft and you'll always be able to chuck out some stuff but I think that you'll, you'll always find yourself artistically trapped, you know, working on other people's cues, working with other people's melodies. You know, how do you break through with your own voice where you've actually just been assisting others? But I can say from what I've observed, HOD, it takes longer for you to break through as a composer in your own right. I would say at least 10 years, but that's fine. And you will have a, you know, a real stable grounding that will, people will hopefully feel that you're a safe set of hands. Breaking through from there to becoming an Oscar winner or a BAFTA winner is more difficult. The music maker route, to the outsider it can appear that these people just suddenly break through and they're just doing the top stuff. And I think that um, it may be true to a certain sense but they have been successful music makers, which is one of the most difficult thing in any of the arts. To, to make a success, to break through as a music maker is, is lottery odds. Do they have longevity? I'm not entirely sure. The way I see it for a successful career where you earn awards and you, you know, your career is a, a steady, wow, a steady incline. The, the, I, from what I can observe, it's when people manage to dial closer to the intersection of these two things. So I think a great example is someone like Dario Marinelli. There's no questioning this guy is an amazing composer, you know, and doing stuff that I'd happily sit in a concert hall and listen to. But he's also, you know, I've watched him work. He is also a master of his craft. You know, this guy, I've never seen someone reconfigure a cue when it's been recut annoyingly with, you know, we've just taken a couple of seconds out. This man really knows how to do his craft. So I would say being able to dial into the centre of these two entry points in film and TV I think is, is the real, that's the golden goose. So segment three of this series, I'm going to talk about how you sustain a career and how you break through artistically when I haven't managed to do that, but how I think you can. I think being poor is a consideration and I will talk about developing a career and how you can finance it also at the same time later on. One more thing. People ask me, uh, should you pitch? And I think that there are people in the no camp and there are people in the yes camp. And I'm firmly in the middle. Uh, I didn't pitch for Poirot. I felt that I'd worked with the people um, and proven myself. And I felt, well, am I going to be able to provide you with examples of the ap approach to Poirot that, that, that are going to be better than examples I can provide that I've already recorded? Um, so I gave them a mood board of stuff that I, I'd already done and go, listen, I, I proved my my oats, I've proved myself an HOD, I've proved myself as an, a, a composer, orchestrator and arranger. Um, so I got that the, the next day. Now, Alien Isolation, I wanted to pitch on that with my brother and his business partner, Alexis. I wanted to pitch on that because one, we had the time to do it. Two, we had a very strong idea of artistic direction. And they say, oh, last saying, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. So we really wanted to represent ourselves. But three, also we gave ourselves quite a sizable budget to do it. And I think that what we did, we were just utterly proud of. We just were able to hand that in and go, there's absolutely no way that we could have done it any better, that it doesn't represent better the feelings that we have for how we can provide an emotional current for Alien Isolation. We got that gig. 
But I have pitched on many things that I haven't got, and I'm not a good pitcher. But the thing about pitching is it belies the creative process. Uh, you don't hit a hole in one composition knee. You work with the directors and the producers and the games makers to create a lingua franca, and this takes weeks and months. And I find it aggravating that uh, often pitching is used as a way of them creatively working out which way is going to work. You know, often they'll give it to an editor to put it up against pitch. Well, that's not right. When well, it's completely on brief, but it's not right. So that's my feeling on pitching. I don't, I don't like it at all. My other feeling is if you can't afford time to do it effectively, time to do it to deliver something that is master quality, then you just shouldn't do it. I had a friend who once said that he spent an afternoon pitching for something and didn't get it, but he thought it was really strong. And he bumped into the guy who did get the gig and he went, come and look at this. And this guy had paid for a 20 piece orchestra to work this pitch up, but he also paid for a camera crew with dollies and cranes to come in and film the process. So he handed it to them, just went, listen, this is how I do it. And it's like, this is with a few instruments and that sounds amazing and look, at he's got a camera and all of that kind of stuff. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that is what you're up against. But I think also know thyself. You may pitch on stuff and may lose out to composers who haven't pitched on it at all. This is because they're known and trusted. And one of the reasons why they're asking you to pitch is because often, say for example with the BBC, they're asked to say, listen, you've got to cast the net out a bit and see if there's anything else out there. Because it's very likely that the reason you're being asked to pitch and the guy you're next to, who possibly your girl, you're next to who's not being asked to pitch and may win the gig, the reason you're being asked to pitch is because you're going from karting to Indy 500.